Good evening, Good everybody. Welcome to this ICOM webinar, Recover and Recreate, Stimulating Employment in the Museum Sector, sponsored by the French Ministry of Culture. It's great to be with you online tonight from here, Canberra, uh, Australia, and indeed, whatever time it is in your part of the world. My name is Matthew Trinker, and I'm Director of the National Museum of Australia and Chair of ICOM Australia's National Committee. Tonight's webinar is being translated in French, English and Spanish, and you can choose your language by clicking on the interpretation button on your screen. As always in my country, I begin tonight by acknowledging the first peoples of land where I live, the Ngunnawal, Nunawal, Nambri people, traditional owners of the Canberra region. I extend that acknowledgement to the first peoples across the world who are joining us tonight. This webinar will look at a question that I think is pre preoccupying many of us in the museum sector as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and its impacts. Our topic, Recover and Recreate, Stimulating Employment in the Museum Sector, speaks directly to the challenges our sector faces as we deal with a crisis that has affected almost every nation on earth and threatens institutions and organisations we hold dear. Quite frankly, I think none of us could have imagined what would be ahead uh, as we contemplated the year uh, at its beginning on New Year's Eve in 2019. Less than a year later, here we are, having experienced more than 50 my, 55 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide and 1.33 million deaths, sadly, all around the world. In our own sector, more than 90% of museums uh, have been forced to close, at least for a time, and the fear is that some, at least, may close permanently. In a moment, we're going to hear from Director General of ICOM, uh, Peter Keller, who will present the results of the most recent ICOM survey held between September and October this year, which ups, updates the data that was collected in a similar survey earlier uh, this year. And we know enough already, I think, really to understand that the future for museums will not simply be about recovering where we were. In many ways, the pandemic has stimulated changes that will be with us forever. Uh, we hope for a silver bullet in the form of vaccines under development and the prospect of herd immunity, but COVID-19 will be with us for many years to come. Uh, one of the hardest hit areas, of course, is global tourism, one that uh, is, has very clear implications for museums that are so embedded in that industry. It's hard to entirely predict the future, but it seems that we may have to wait many years, if ever, before we see international travel recover to pre-COVID levels. Uh, indeed, our use of communications technology has also developed rapidly in this time, with most of us now at ease of working from online from home or indeed meeting in the way that we are tonight, uh, in a way, frankly, that was completely different from what we might have thought common or normal uh, a few months ago. And as a result, really, the character and the nature, I think, of the workplace is changing. We think differently about where we work and how we work, and this, of course, is impacting on our sense of the social space of museums. Revenue streams for museums have been deeply impacted and sadly this has already led to significant job losses in many places. The next generation of museum workers, our younger staff, are among the most vulnerable. Entry level jobs in the sector are under great pressure as we look for savings to achieve some measure of sustainability for our institutions. All of this, all of this requires us to think deeply about how we might not simply recover from the COVID-19 crisis, but rather recreate the idea of the museum in a post-pandemic age. And to discuss the issue, we first need to know how the sector has been impacted. And I'm delighted now to be able to introduce Peter Keller to give his presentation on the survey results. Peter, of course, is the Director General of ICOM, a former treasurer of the organisation. He studied art history in Vienna, Bonn, Cologne, Cologne, as well as uh, museology in Paris. He's worked in major museums in Europe, served on juries for museum accreditation and the National Advisory Council for Museums in Austria. Uh, Peter, you have the floor. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, ICOM, you all know, is the only global association of museums and museum professionals with about 49,000 members now in 138 countries, active in developing professional standards, capacity building, defending the world's heritage and communicating the value of museums to society. And 
Of course, when the COVID pandemic started, ICOM has immediately responded to this challenge in order to support the international museum community. Among other initiatives, we launched two surveys in April and September to get an overview about the situation that none of us knew before. The lockdowns, and if we speak about the consequences of the pandemic, of course, it's also the lockdowns which uh, came, which were decreed everywhere. Uh, they caused a profound disruption in the sector. Uh, Matthew already mentioned in spring, almost all museums around the world were closed, 95% for two months or more. In September, half of them were open, but many of them closed again since then. And some of the museums in, in certain regions, like Latin America, remained closed all summer. And most of the museum staff had been working remotely in spring and also in September, staff was still uh, working remotely. The collections of museums weren't affected because conservation security had been ensured and was uh, maintained. But the economic impact of the pandemic and the lockdowns is substantial. One third of the museums expect to lose more than half of their income, especially in Asia, Africa, and the Arab region. And of course, museums in tourist regions and institutions relying on earned income are more affected than community museums and institutions receiving public funding. For, therefore, all around the world, the sector is now downsizing. Two thirds of the respondents of our survey expect that their museum will reduce programs. 60%. 14% uh, of the staff has been furloughed or had their contract not renewed. Uh, with the regional differences, uh, these figures are higher in certain regions and in the highest in North America with 20% furloughed or their contract not renewed. And as Matthew said, this concerns certain professions and also certain, uh, certain age, uh, especially young professionals are affected because they often have limited contracts and certain um, sectors such as education, but also conservation is concerned by the furloughs and the uh, ending of contracts. There were also responses that expect their museum to close permanently in spring, 13% gave this answer. Now in September, they were 6%, but again with important differences from region to region. Uh, here, the highest rate was 22% in the Arab region, 22% expecting their museum to close permanently. The closures, of course, uh, led to a loss of income, but also, of course, a loss of, of contact, if I may say, with the communities surrounding the museums, with the public. So uh, this was a fear of our colleagues. Uh, they museums try to overcome, uh, try to in, uh, cope with the situation and are innovating. The pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation of the sector. Half of the museums around the world increased their activities in social media. They were already active. Many of them were already active, but uh, increased this activity and also increased uh, different online activities, access to collections, events, and learning programs. Again, with regional differences, learning programs were digitized, uh, especially in, in North America, events in North America and Asia, and access to collections was uh, digitized in Europe. These, most of these activities are for free, but museums will have to generate income, among other things, from these activities to cover the losses, to stabilize their businesses, and to create jobs in the future. And this is the topic of our webinar today. And I hand over back to Matthew to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. And um, there are some cautious grounds for optimism, I think, in seeing some of those figures and the changes in the course of the year, but still many challenges ahead for all of us involved uh, in this sector. Our four speakers tonight are really drawn from across the length and breadth of the museum world, and each is going to speak for about four or five minutes in turn. And at the conclusion of the presentations, I'll lead off with a few questions in a question and answer session and invite you all to submit questions via our Yuka chat. Uh, 
First to speak will be Katya Trakina, the OECD's Coordinator of Culture, Creative Industries and Local Development within the Centre for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Her recent work includes the OECD note on COVID-19 and cultural and creative sectors. Uh, next will be an old friend, Angelita Teo, Director of the Olympic Foundation for Culture and Heritage in Lausanne in Switzerland. Angelita was previously Senior Director of the National Heritage Board of Singapore, where our paths crossed, Director both of the National Museum of Singapore as a result, and also Festival Director of the annual Singapore Heritage Festival and Singapore Night Festival. She'll be followed by Maria Mercedes Gonzalez, Director of the Modern Art Museum of Medellin in uh, Colombia with more than 15 years professional experience in cultural management, communications and international relations in the public and non-profit sectors. She was in charge, in fact, of the museum's expansion and reorientation of the artistic and cultural project of the MAWM in recent years. And finally, we'll hear from Daniel Ronan, a principal consultant at Resilient Heritage in Chicago, USA. And Daniel has more than a decade of experience in the nonprofit sector, working in museums, in tourism, international relations and community development. He started the Resilient Heritage blog and firm in 2014 to show how arts, culture and heritage organisations communicate their benefits to society. But first, I'll hand over to Katya Trokina, who's presenting on Culture Shock, COVID-19 and the cultural and creative sectors and examining policies to stimulate employment in museums. Katya. Thank you so much, Matthew, and uh, welcome to all. Uh, I'm very glad to be around this table and I thank you, ICOM, for this ongoing, very successful, very important partnership that we have between the two organizations. Uh, well, many of you might just uh, ask themselves what the OECD is uh, doing here, because we're not so well known for our work on culture. And indeed, we didn't do much on that in the past. But we see that there is this increasing attention from the cities and regions across the globe to the social and economic impact cultural and creative sectors can have on local development. So we are starting to slowly step into this uh, field to provide evidence, data and policy advice to national and local governments in this area. Uh, we don't work so much with the ministries of culture, I must say. Our constituency is are the ministries of employment, regional development, economic development, inclusion. So our value added probably is to mainstream culture, uh, the cultural agenda across these policy portfolios, usefully complementing what uh, other organizations are, are doing. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, um, uh, well, we see that the impact of the crisis is quite dramatic and Peter has just provided uh, some striking numbers. Uh, and this is quite dramatic also across other creative sectors. Um, and uh, we would think that uh, the effects of this crisis will be quite long lasting uh, for a combination of factors. There is a decreased demand, the international uh, tourism will be slowly to recover. Uh, there is very, uh, there's an investment shock in the sectors. Uh, so the sector is really in uh, danger. Uh, and already, um, well, a few months ago in April, uh, we um, started to analyze this situation together with ICOM when we had the first talk uh, series on the impact of the crisis on museums and jobs in the museums. Uh, and already there, of course, we saw that the impact is quite uh, dramatic on the jobs within the museum. But what is important to underline is that all the also on the jobs around the museums, all these freelance professionals, creative workers who provide all sorts of services to the museum and not only to the museums, but to other creative uh, sectors in, in their city, in their region. So, and they are also very much affected. And this, these jobs that we don't so much see on the, in the official statistics, uh, unfortunately, um, and this, crisis uh, uh, well, really showed uh, very clearly the fragility of the sector, which is composed of, of course, big institutions, but also all this network and ecosystem of uh, micro firms, freelance professionals who combined, try to combine sometimes paid job with uh, um, um, a freelance job. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, we also see 
that many public support uh, um, programs and policies, it, which were introduced now to support all sorts of the economic sectors, are quite ill adapted to the very specific nature of creative jobs. Uh, and going forward, it's very important to address, and that's what we are uh, really saying within the OECD to the member countries' ministries of employment and uh, business development, that it's very important to adapt the self-employment support schemes by simplifying the eligibility criteria to these hybrid new forms of employment that are very typical for the sector. And it's also very important to include non-profit institutions like museums in support programs that are designed to help small businesses to retain their employees. It's also important to think about tax incentives for corporate and individual donations, especially in the parts of the world where these constitute a lot, um, an important uh, share of museums uh, uh, funding. Uh, and also it's important, and that can be done very much by cities, that the support to cultural organizations reaches artists and the other creative professionals. Uh, and of course, we also encourage cities and regions and national governments during this crisis, which continues, unfortunately, to invest in cultural production so that once the recovery starts, there are, well, people are still there to <laughs> create the, the, the creative content. Uh, so over the medium term, we think that it's very important to solve this problem with innovation supports uh, for cultural and creative sectors, because we see and we keep repeating that the innovation uh, schemes, the innovation programs that are quite well adapted to traditional businesses, they don't really respond to the specificity of uh, creative firms, for example. People don't know how to uh, evaluate uh, intangible assets, uh, etc. So. Uh, now is really the time to address these deficiencies of the investment support schemes. It's very important, well, uh, it's obviously, it's obvious already, Peter started mentioning it, that uh, there is a, this digital push, incredible digital push, and uh, museums are very generous in providing uh, contents for free uh, for all of us. But we also see in the OECD that uh, the digital gap uh, is quite uh, broad in the OECD countries, and I don't even speak about other parts of the world. Within one country, the access to the digital infrastructure can vary between capital metropolitan areas and rural areas quite significantly. And this can is, is contributing badly to uh, this increasing social divides in terms of access to culture, culture, but also access to education. And going forward, uh, it's also important to support this cross feeds, which were very much reinforced between the cultural sector, the museums working with schools, with other educational institutions. So also through digital means this, this can be reinforced going forward and provide uh, market opportunities and create new jobs and new skills for future recovery. And the same uh, for cross feeds between culture, health and well-being. Uh, uh, also, we are advising cities and regions to rethink their development models, which were probably based on mass tourism in the past, but now should really smartly focus on sustainable cultural tourism and work also in partnership with museums and other cultural uh, venues. And it's important also to support uh, cultural and creative entrepreneurship. Uh, so it's the time now for very smart uh, partnerships at the local level uh, and I wanted uh, to finish my uh, um, short intervention by mentioning uh, this guide that we have developed together with ICOM, which provides really clear guidelines on how local governments and museums can work together to maximize the impact of heritage culture on a local development. Um, and I think it's quite a smart thing because we um, bring as OECD the local government's community and ICOM brings the museum community. And what we're trying to say to both our constituencies is that they have to work in a, a partnership and local governments should recognize this uh, incredible and uh, very important social and economic uh, role that museums are playing. And when one says recognize, one also means provide uh, funding, access to funding for educational programs, for inclusion programs and, and the like. So, uh, and also local governments need to support this very rich partnerships between museums, uh, educational sector, health sector, etc., on the ground uh, to also support the recovery going forward. So Matthew, maybe I stop here and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Great, thanks Katya. Our next presenter is Angelita Teo, who'll be speaking on the new business models for museums and emerging professionals 
in a COVID-19 environment with reference particularly to the Olympic Foundation for Culture and Heritage. Angelita. Hi everyone, a very good afternoon from sunny Lausanne. Um, I have to say that we are in our second lockdown at this point, uh, unfortunately, and so the uh, Olympic Museum is close to the end of uh, November. Um, and I have been, um, I, I, as Matthew has shared, I was previously from Singapore and I arrived in Lausanne last year, October, thinking that I'll be in the middle of Europe and having the joy of traveling around and, and I've been stuck at home. Uh, and I'm home now, as you can tell. Uh, but what I really wanted to uh, share today, um, because uh, of the time we have, is some of the efforts within the foundation uh, in, in terms of reacting to the COVID situation. I won't cover so much about the exhibitions and programs that we have uh, adapted because of COVID-19, but I will later share um, on the chat the links to some of these uh, efforts on our part, which is really um, to, to reach out to uh, the local and international uh, communities that, uh, communities that we, we serve um, uh, through more through digital engagement. And in, in fact, uh, a lot of the things that we are planning today for, for uh, next year and then hopefully it's post COVID by then is all based on what we, um, a new word I, I've learned, uh, which is worse than edutainment, it's called digital, which is the blending of uh, physical and, and, and digital. And that's something I think uh, all of us has to consider in terms of content uh, that we do. So like I mentioned, um, I, I uh, did a little bit of research um, to uh, kind of uh, find out a little bit more. And now there's actually a, a, a wonderful video that's produced by the World Economic Forum that was posted very recently on the 20th of October that kind of succinctly uh, talk about uh, the issues we are facing in terms of not just um, uh, the job market for the cultural and heritage uh, landscape, but, but overall as well. So I thought I'll share this, but I'll also share the link uh, in the chat as well, because uh, it's a good video. I hope you can. COVID-19 is one of the biggest crises of our time. It has impacted every single one of us, shaken our social systems, and disrupted every sector of our economies. The automation of work combined with the global recession led workers to lose their jobs at an accelerated pace compared to previous years. And this trend is expected to continue. The ongoing shift in the division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms might displace 85 million jobs worldwide in the next five years. While 97 million new roles, ones that are more adapted to this new task distribution, may emerge. By 2025, companies expect to displace roughly 6% of their total workforce. One in two workers will need reskilling and those remaining in their current roles will need to update 40% of their skill set to adapt to the changing labor market. There is a way to collectively benefit from these challenging times. Decades of research have shown that the most valuable asset of any economy or company is its human capital. Around the globe, companies are already experiencing a shortage in relevant skills for future roles and are investing in reskilling and upskilling their workforce. By 2025, organizations say they will train over 70% of their employees to ensure they can smoothly transition into the jobs of tomorrow. These include DevOps engineers, artificial intelligence specialists, digital marketing managers, talent acquisition specialists, and customer success specialists. It will take on average between two weeks and five months for workers to pick up new skills, allowing them to move into these new roles. But data shows they won't need to have the perfect skill set to start transitioning. While two thirds of employers expect to get a return on investment in employees reskilling programs within just one year, governments will also need to step in to update and fund education and training systems and to ensure displaced workers have adequate safety nets. With purposeful leadership and collaboration, we can turn this global crisis into a unique opportunity to transition into a future of jobs that is inclusive, fair, and sustainable. With safety nets, and unique opportunity. 
Oops, uh, let me see if I can move on to the next slide. Um, COVID-19 okay, is one of the biggest... Oops. Yep. Um, so I, I thought I'll provide a little bit of a, a short background about the Olympic Foundation for Culture and Heritage. Um, and really, um, it consists of um, four units, which is the uh, International Olympic Com Committee's Heritage Management, which is where we have all our collect heritage collections. Uh, we have the Olympic Studies Center, uh, the Olympic Museum, and we have a unit that manages our international cultural affairs. Uh, but what I really wanted to uh, take this opportunity to talk about is uh, since I joined uh, the foundation, we went through a restructuring and we actually uh, have new centralized uh, support services. And because we started our um, restructuring exercise in, in February this year, um, the COVID situation was really uh, taken into consideration in this process as well. And what we have managed to come up with is basically a vision statement that states that uh, our vision is to make Olympism, Olympic culture and heritage relevant and, and accessible to all. And I think what's really important here is, is relevance. I think uh, relevance uh, focuses on results uh, based on the importance of increasing awareness and engagement. Um, and it's also extremely important to be uh, accessible to all. And what that really means for us is putting people in the center of the process to ensure that accessibility to both physical and technological uh, aspects of the work we do. Uh, this is really uh, how we hope to move forward uh, to engage uh, more new supporters uh, for the Olympic uh, movement as well and to also ensure that we are future proofing the collection uh, for the uh, organization. So I wanted to explain a little bit about the formation of a new unit. Um, and this unit is actually called the Development and Innovation um, uh, Unit. And what it is, is basically a unit that, um, I mean, of course, in, in this situation, we weren't able to uh, um, get, employ new staff to um, kind of um, create a, a, new, uh, organ, a new unit. But what we had to do was actually to go through all the different um, departments within the foundation to find uh, suitable candidates to join this new um, uh, team and it wasn't uh, particularly easy uh, simply because people were very attached to their old teams uh, but what we wanted to do was to have uh, to bring people together from various units within the foundation with certain skill sets like project management content creation uh, digital and international marketing expertise as well as um, having the personality and attitude which is geared towards uh, embracing change and innovation so what this team does is they ensures that this, uh, there is a strategic coherence and accountability of all operations and projects undertaken by the foundation and help and, ho and hopefully uh, help to cultivate uh, innovation, creativity, uh, collaboration and, and growth across the, the foundation as a whole as well. Uh, in fact, I, I took this image from uh, a, a, our recent um, uh, ad for, for, the, for this particular role. And I have to say that the job market is, is really quite uh, worrying because we have never gotten over 200 applicants uh, for anything that we advertise. So you can tell that there is a lot of people with um, uh, cultural background uh, that are out there looking for, for new opportunities as well. The other thing is um, an effort within the uh, foundation. Uh, the foundation has about close to 90 staff. Um, the average uh, age is uh, probably in the late 30s to 40. Um, and um, a good majority has been with the foundation for, for more than 10 to, to 15 years. Uh, and embracing social media, media wasn't um, that, uh, should I say, uh, um, well established. And because of the lockdown in March, we decided to start this hashtag, which is called OFCH Together. And we wanted to create an opportunity for people to familiarize themselves with social media and to be more comfortable with social media uh, at the same time. But what we realized uh, quickly is that um, there needs to be other kinds of opportunities for staff to come together. 
And so we started this uh, virtual sessions, uh, which um, invites both um, colleagues from other departments at the IOC, as well as uh, international experts in the culture and heritage arena to come and speak to our staff. Um, this is really has been an effort to create opportunities for staff to, to come together more frequently, but to also have a fun way of, of learning new skills and being exposed to new things uh, that is a, a available uh, to, to us in terms of uh, creating more experiential experience and um, more immersive experience for our um, visitors or our online um, audience as well. So as you can tell, uh, we have been quite active and the next session will be in December uh, by the founder of uh, Moment Factory and he, they do amazing things. Um, so what I really wanted to conclude is that um, I hope that through this short um, presentation of mine that is evident that it's not just the responsibility of a staff to, as an individual to rescale or upscale themselves but we uh, as organizations should also create a environment to promote uh, a learning organization that is skilled at creating, acquiring and transferring knowledge and at modifying its behavior to reflect new knowledge and insights. This is really to ensure that museums and cultural institutions remain relevant and accessible to our visitors and communities that we serve. So um, with that, um, I'd like to pass it back to Matt, thank you. Thanks, Angelita. Uh, we'll turn now to Maria Mercedes Gonzalez, who's presenting on the Modern Art Museum of Medellin and advocacy and mobilization of networks for museums through new programs and works. Maria. Medellín, que es una entidad sin ánimo de lucro, una entidad privada fundada en 1998 por un grupo de artistas de esta ciudad. Eh, después de un largo tiempo, eh, a raíz de la pandemia, eh, volvimos a abrir las puertas del museo el pasado 2 de septiembre. Quisiera presentar eh, el día de hoy sobre 12, 12 los retos más importantes en estos meses de hoy, el equipo de trabajo, alrededor de dos proyectos que son parte fundamental de la acción y de la misión del museo y que representan asimismo eh, recursos, ingresos muy importantes para la ¿Cómo con la pandemia tuvimos que eh, readaptar? Eh, dar más bien estos programas para llevarlos al mundo. El, el primer programa es un programa que se llama Inspiración con Fama. Con Fama es, una, es un gran aliado del museo. Con Fama, para que ustedes entiendan, es una entidad que acá en Colombia se llama Caja de Compensación, donde están afiliados eh, los trabajadores, la población eh, asalariada eh, del país, y son entidades que cumplen un rol muy importante en términos eh, de recreación, educación, eh, vivienda y actividades eh, extralaborales. Y CONFAMA es un, un aliado muy importante del museo. Antes de la pandemia, desde el año 2017, tenemos con ellos un programa de visitas taller que hace posible eh, que niños, niñas y jóvenes de colegios públicos de Medellín y el área metropolitana eh, visiten en este programa de visitas taller busca eh, enriquecer la vida escolar, eh, despertar interés, necesita difundir el conocimiento que tienen las personas y por supuesto que estimular la creatividad. Y entre 2017 y 2019, antes de la pandemia, eh, habíamos logrado eh, beneficiar a través de este programa a 20 niños, niñas y jóvenes eh, de estos colegios. Llega la pandemia, eh, por supuesto que se cierra el museo, eh, no hay más visitas escolares, por ahora tampoco las, las habrá, no sabemos hasta cuándo, 
eh, entonces empieza una negociación y una conversación con Confama para cómo no perder una población tan importante para la vida del museo, una comunidad tan importante como el público escolar y cómo además no perder un ingreso que es también muy importante para el museo. Son más o menos 65 mil euros a través de un proyecto como este. Entonces, eh, pues tratamos de explorar un poco cómo sería el aprendizaje a través de, de plataformas. Nos encontramos que hay todavía un alto porcentaje de niños y niñas que no tienen acceso a Entonces, ¿cómo poder trabajar con ellos también? Así que tuvimos que reenfocar el, el programa, crear un nuevo metodología de aprendizaje y aprendizaje tradicional es aquel en, en el que eh, la persona, el niño, la niña va al colegio, recibe una clase, y se lleva unos materiales y tareas eh, a su casa. Aquí se trataba de eh, invertir entonces esa experiencia cómo el niño o la niña podía tener una experiencia autónoma, una experiencia autodirigida y después sí una experiencia eh, de mentoría. Para ello realizamos, por supuesto, un material eh, didáctico, un material en video que lo pueden eh, consultar a través del chat, un material impreso, por supuesto, para estos niños que les cuento que no tienen posibilidad eh, de conexión. Eh, y logramos entonces, digamos que ya las visitas, no son las visitas tradicionales al espacio físico, sino eh, el encuentro con los mediadores, el encuentro con los educadores, luce de esta manera. Entonces, los niños reciben un material, ya sea en vivo o ya sea un material eh, físico, y en un segundo momento tienen eh, esta, este encuentro y esta experiencia con los mediadores, ya sea a través de estas plataformas o a llamada telefónica, que ha sido también un reto muy interesante la llamada telefónica eh, para los niños que no tienen posibilidad de conectar. Esperamos entonces a final de año poder beneficiar a 7.000 niños, una cifra muy parecida a la de los años eh, anteriores, no perder el proyecto tan importante de Confama. Y finalmente, el otro proyecto que reestructuramos va a muy bien, se llama Museo Cultura, es la oferta de cursos, talleres y laboratorios del museo que está dirigido a públicos muy diversos y este año lo que hicimos fue repensar en cuáles serían los contenidos y cómo sería ese aprendizaje a través eh, de la virtualidad. Logramos mantener este programa eh, de cursos y talleres que ha sido además muy exitoso. Este año hemos tenido 200 personas más, 200 estudiantes más. Hemos logrado mantener ese ingreso, el ingreso, los, los cursos eh, a través de estas plataformas son un poco eh, menos costosos. Logramos mantener ese ingreso y logramos además poder llegar a personas que están por fuera de Medellín, que viven en otras ciudades del país y que incluso viven eh, en otros países. Entonces, son eh, ejemplos de cómo la pandemia eh, nos exigió este, este reto y este compromiso de cómo hacer para no perder la acción misional de la, de la institución y cómo a la vez eh, no perder ese ingreso de un aliado, en el caso del proyecto de inspiración con fama, y de, eh, de lo que paga la gente por estos cursos eh, y talleres y aliviar un poco eh, pues lo difícil que ha sido la crisis. Muchísimas gracias a todos y por la atención y por la invitación. Thank you, Maria Mercedes. We turn now to the final um, presentation from Daniel Ronan, who will be speaking to us about the Prairie State Museums project and how museums communicate their inherent community and economic value in the COVID-19 crisis. Daniel. There we go. Good morning, everyone. This is Daniel Ronan. I am uh, presenting this morning from Chicago, and I just wanted to thank everyone 
uh, for partic participating in this uh, presentation and allowing me to present alongside you all. Um, I am uh, the principal at uh, Resilient Heritage, which is a consultancy based here in Chicago, uh, working on organizational development, uh, fundraising, as well as public engagement for uh, arts and culture and heritage nonprofits uh, across the United States. Uh, I'm also uh, serving on uh, the uh, ICOM US board as a board member, as well as, um, as, well as on um, the uh, Jampus board as well for historic house museums. So thank you once again. Today I'll be speaking about um, uh, Prairie State Museums project which is uh, very much a labor of love that has happened in result of the, as a result of the pandemic, uh, particularly what we find um, with <laughs> these incredible times that we're in in 2020 is that we, we find ourselves doing things that we never thought we would be doing. And so um, as a result of that, uh, I actually saw a uh, funding opportunity from the Pulitzer Center uh, on crisis reporting, which is based in, in Washington, DC, uh, focusing on uh, journalism and in particular freelance journalists. And as uh, a freelancer or independent contractor myself, I thought this was a great opportunity as someone who's involved in museums to uh, align myself with those professionals, uh, ways that we could really uh, strengthen the conversation around museums and how they're facing the pandemic and also do so in a way that is uh, constructed to those uh, trying to amplify uh, the issues that museums are facing at this moment. The Prairie State Museums Project, uh, this shape here is actually a profile of the state of Illinois, uh, where Chicago is located. Chicago is located at the uh, northeast corner of the state, and uh, the state is known as the Prairie State, which is the original grasslands of this area. Um, 0.01% um, of these grasslands actually still exist. But what I really uh, tried to do was to emphasize the need to stress the cultural and uh, economic uh, contributions of these museums across the state and not just those large museums based in Chicago. But first, before going further and talking about the project, I wanted to really focus on the moment that we're experiencing here in the United States, and I think which has been uh, really reprised abroad in various protests around the killing of George Floyd and the broader uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I think for far too long we've had institutions that are not responsive to their communities or inclusive enough to really reflect uh, the uh, cultures that we portend to represent. So I think this uh, context and this cultural moment can allow us to really innovate. And as I heard yesterday, actually, the, the box is gone, right? There's, there's no thinking outside the box because we're here uh, leading um, new initiatives in a very uh, collaborative and uh, open and innovative community that we should. And really, that's the whole um, point of this project is really expanding that community and in a sense, expanding the museum looking for collaborators out of the, the traditional museum sector or field. And in this case, for this project, we employed 16 uh, different freelancers from across the state of Illinois, 14 of whom, um, rather, from 14 different news outlets. Nine of these journalists identify as people of color, six of whom are women of color, representing the communities that are most impacted by uh, the outcomes or the unfortunate uh, effects of COVID-19, including infections and deaths. Um, one thing that I think is really telling in, in the midst of this pandemic is that the United States is the only, uh, the only country uh, in the world, uh, developed world, that um, doesn't have uh, secured healthcare. And particularly for uh, museums, this impacts them greatly. Uh, the American Alliance of Museums has stated that one in three museums could close as a result of this pandemic. So we are facing um, telling issues when it comes to not only our institution's health, but our individual health as well. Um, but 
looking at that, we really need to broadcast this, um, this message to as many folks as possible. And that was really the, um, the need here uh, with uh, the, uh, the expansive um, uh, circulation and web visitors and listeners uh, that we engaged throughout this project. And quickly, here are some of the narratives that you can explore on our project website. Uh, one is the Miles Davis House uh, outside of St. Louis in the state of Illinois. Uh, the other is uh, Shedd Aquarium here in Chicago. Um, the Laurent House in Rockford, the only uh, accessible uh, Frank Lloyd Wright House in the world, as well as the Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. Really from Chicago to Carbondale at the very southern tip of the state, we try to uh, really expand conversation and engage more people in the narrative of how museums are facing this pandemic. And to explore more, you can uh, go to our website, which is also available in Spanish and French. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel. We turn now to uh, the question and answer um, section of the webinar. And I just want to remind you all that if you have a question, please feel free to send it through to us by writing uh, in uh, Yuka chat. Uh, and I'll endeavour to get to them after the initial questions about to ask each of our speakers. And remember, you can submit questions in French, in English and in Spanish. And I'd um, also just remind everyone again to please fill in the satisfaction survey in the chat box. And if you're in the Yuka platform, you'll need to copy and paste the link uh, for the two questions. If we perhaps just start um, this section that I really hope will develop into a discussion about this theme, I want to turn to Katia first and just ask you what you think the single most important thing is that we can do in the museum sector to stimulate and support employment at this time. And I was struck by you speaking about the importance of partnerships uh, at a local level. Katia. Well, Matthew, I'm a bit... Uh afraid to speak what the museum sector should be doing. I mean, it's, it's not really our role to say anything. Well, to you people, you, you, um, uh, to, to this all, uh, to this uh, incredible pool of experience and understanding. Maybe I would rather focus on what local governments uh, should be doing and also um, broader the uh, employment services and uh, uh, well, the national governments as well. Um, of course, well, now as this lockdown in some parts of the world continues, um, well, a few months ago, we were thinking that, okay, there are there's all these packages of rescue measures, immediate supports uh, for a couple of months and then things will become normal. Unfortunately not. So there is still this need for the rescue packages to be still there. And we'll understand that the, the budgets, national and local, are very much under constraints, and uh, they also have uh, they have this incredible health expenditures as well. But still, I mean, if we want to for this um, anchor institutions as museums, the significant cultural institutions to survive, still, I mean, grants and rescue funding is still very. Uh, important. And what we see, what is lacking really in the understanding of many uh, um, national policymakers is this uh, ecosystem view uh, of the overall cultural labor market. So it's very important to support the institutions, but it's very important also to support directly people and give them access to the different employment support and income compensation measures. Uh, and well, it varies across the different contexts. And we heard from uh, the United States that there are very particular, uh, there is a very particular context there. In some other parts of the world, there are no income support measures, but still, overall, I want to stress that in the OECD countries, that's uh, uh, how uh, uh, things should be um, uh, going, well, should be addressed. And yes, I mean, partnerships, well, maybe people are a bit uh, tired of hearing partnership, partnerships. Uh, uh, this is an overused uh, uh, word. But now I do think that pooling the resources together, putting different minds together, this is the way uh, forward, really. And in a way, this is the um, role of the local government, not just providing funding, but really facilitating all this uh, uh, integrated thinking uh, and, and pooling the resources uh, together to address common uh, challenges. And maybe another thing to, to do, it was quite striking to see that uh, 
Okay, everyone understood that the cultural sector uh, is in the, this shock. Uh, and everyone says we value culture, we want to continue to have access to cultural resources. Uh, but then when we look at the composition of the uh, task forces, recovery task forces in many countries, including in some countries like Italy, where, okay, cultural heritage, but well, they have some cultural heritage there, but the cultural sector is often absent from these recovery strategies. And um, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, policies are there not, not only to support the sector, but the sector can support the recovery, in, in, indeed. So it should be part in, of the recovery strategies at city, regional and national level. So maybe I saw that. Katia, I'm struck by your comments about uh, governments, you know, um, needing to support these sectors and how often um, arts and cultural enterprise broadly described is um, absent from the first wave of support that's, uh, that's flowing and indeed... But not um, in your country, not in your country. It was quite striking to see that there is this task force that was created for the restart yeah. of the economy and for the support of the significant institutions. So Australia, well, in Europe, Germany and some other countries, they are really leading the way. Yeah, I, um, I'll remind my colleagues in Australia that when they are... Um, being uh, highly critical of what's happening domestically. Thanks, Katya. Um, Angelita, perhaps with your experience both in Asia and uh, in, in Europe now, you might have seen something in the way uh, that uh, the sector's working in, in both regions that you think might be worth um, pointing out in the context of this desire to stimulate employment, employment at a time of crisis. Have you got any reflection on you know, your experiences in, uh, in Singapore and what they might, um, might mean for your time in Europe in this, uh, in this respect? Um, I think in, in my case, I, I, my, my experience and exposure is a little bit biased because I, I come from, firstly, in, in Singapore, from a public uh, organisation that is uh, very well funded. Uh, in fact, um, all our... Um, majority of, of the museums uh, are in Singapore are publicly funded. Uh, there are only a few small private museums. Um, and as, as such, um, uh, we always have a saying in Singapore, you know, uh, for us in the museum world, uh, we have an iron rice bowl. Um, uh, and, and, and I think the situation currently uh, is, is quite, um, hasn't been, been, badly affected is more of a, an issue about uh, visitorship, uh, visitors' confidence coming back to the museum because Singapore is doing well. Uh, they are moving from um, a, a lockdown phase to slowly opening things up again. Uh, I think that the, the main challenge is not so much about, about job security in, in, in Singapore, uh, but more so about um, getting uh, visitors to come back uh, uh, and, and being able to adapt to some of the um, long-term changes uh, post-COVID. I mean, because of COVID and the, and the pandemic. Uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, I think is, is, is probably um, uh, in, in not as, as good a situation. I think uh, places like, like in, in, in Indonesia and, and, and um, where there's quite a lot of private museums, a lot of uh, contemporary museums and a lot of reliance on, on foreign um, uh, partnerships and, and collaborations for some of, of their, their work. I think that has been uh, quite badly affected. Um, in in China is is diversified. You really can't. I mean, there's everything under the under the sun in terms of uh, public, private, uh, very rich uh, private museums as well. So um, um, I think Asia is generally quite uh, doing quite all right um, in in terms of the job market for for culture and heritage. Europe on on, on the other hand is 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 quite different. I think there's a lot of uh, museums affected. Um, like I said, you know, uh, for us to put out an, an, an effort uh, for a job position to receive two to three hundred, I mean, there are other positions we're advertising as well, is, is quite unprecedented. Usually we get maybe a quarter of that kind of number. So you can tell that there's a lot of people looking for, for new opportunities. Um, but because, again, I, I'm now uh, with the IOC, which is also a, a, a rather um, um, uh, comfortable private organization, the nonprofit for that matter, but, but our, our funding and, and uh, a lot of the, our, um, shall I say, 
priority now lies with the Tokyo Games uh, happening in 21. And if that happens, then I think um, there is uh, life will go back to normal, <laughs> as you say. But this year, we did have a, a 30% um, cut in all our um, 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 funding, uh, largely because we had to support a lot of the international uh, federations, the uh, uh, NOCs and uh, the national Olympic committees around the world because of, of the pandemic. So in, internally, we have tightened our belt extremely and we have actually also um, stopped um, recruiting a new headcount. So for example, those that we're advertising now are, are existing uh, full-time employment uh, positions. Yeah, yeah. so I, I hope that that gives an overall um, yeah, I, look, I think it's, uh, and you, you speak about this question of the, you know, the, the, the sources of income as well, and those museums, obviously, that are dependent on revenue that they're generating for visitors, as opposed to those that are publicly funded and perhaps are not, uh, uh, are not so assiduously having to, to mm -hmm. raise their own funds. I think there is a big differential, isn't there, in, yeah. uh, in what the experiences of museums has been in this crisis. Maria Mercedes, I wonder if, in your case, you might like to reflect on in these audience programs are obviously trying to, you're using to drive support for these um, uh, support and advocacy networks for MAWM. Are you, are you identifying the need for new skills or capabilities that you need for these kinds of new programming efforts? And have you been able to bring those people into the museum um, to sustain the, the investment in these um, programs? Well, yes, uh, indeed, the whole pandemic situation and the need of uh, having a digital transformation in the museums has definitely made that new skills, new capabilities are um, crucial in our teams. In our team specifically, there's been a big mm, uh, cap learning capability. We have been very fast in learning. We, we have learned on the spot. We have been very open-minded in that way. And I am very lucky, lucky to work with a very young team. Um, most of my colleagues are digital natives. So they know these tools, these codes, all, all these new ways of working are not so new for them. And uh, I believe it was interesting to see how the team, even though they were hired before that and they were hired for different kind of work, uh, it was interesting to see how they put all their effort and their uh, energy to adapt, to, to learn, to adjust to this new situation, but definitely uh, looking to the to the future for the next year and the following years is going to be very important to include in our teams people uh, with different skills. For example, uh, audiovisual production. This is now basic. This is essential, and I believe many. Uh, I mean, much of the of the funds of the money. Uh, on the, uh, through the pandemic has gone to that, to, to audiovisual production. So we need that in our teams. We need people able to work on that field because otherwise it's going to be very expensive to, to outsource um, uh, the communication team, for example. We, uh, our team, our communications team had a very, uh, very huge challenge, maybe bigger than other teams uh, regarding the fact that communication is digital, is digital. People is not reading uh, newspapers anymore. We stop printing. We stop uh, distributing uh, leaflets. So, the also another team, education team, uh, that has to design uh, their their programs. Well, they they had to readjust and to to reskill and upskill themselves because now knowledge learning and the essence of a museum is to tr is, is transmission through this kind of platforms as well. But I believe that um, for next year, it's going to be very, very important to include in our teams, professionals with different and new skills and, and, and competencies. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I think we're, we're realizing that some of the 
the um, foundations of the museum, if you like, um, in the 19th century in terms of our skills base, really, and the, the sodalities of professions that we've had in museums are really being um, rethought in this age about the, the relative balance of the kinds of capabilities that we need in the museum to deliver in this kind of, these kinds of conditions. And Daniel, I, I have to tell you, I love the name Resilient Heritage because um, it really speaks of you know, strength and endurance in our cultural heritage, but also the character of the heritage sector itself. And you feel like you need that in, in this age. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit. I was struck by your mention of the use of freelancers and, and knowing that often younger professionals are those that are casualised or um, undertaking freelance work in this sector. I wonder if you might just reflect on that, the precariousness of that existence for our younger professionals coming into um, the sector and what that might mean for the sector going forward. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, I, I guess I'd like to echo some of the comments by uh, Maria Mercedes, uh, in particular about this need to learn and adapt uh, for this new age of particularly those that are sort of born digital mm -hmm. in, this, uh, in this economy. Mm -hmm. um, something that I think is particularly noteworthy is that the United States is very much like China, as um, Angelita was saying, uh, you know, very diverse in terms of how its museums are organized, uh, whether they're nonprofits, for profit, government sponsored. So I think for um, a younger professional going into the field right now, knowing where the revenue streams are coming from is particularly important. For instance, you know, now is when a lot of the funds are being spent uh, in terms of gov uh, government revenue. And there are last year's, um, last year's revenues and grants, right? So. Um, this year, when there's not a lot of revenue happening and a lot of uh, the budget is actually being reoriented towards the COVID-19 response, I think next year we're going to see a lot of cuts to cultural institutions and not as much government, both federal, uh, state, and even local government support for those institutions. So seeing that, that horizon and a lot of museums wanting to cut their costs, I, I think is going to lead to... Uh, a need for younger professionals to really hide skill sets that are able to fit within the needs of organizations um, from the outside and to do that with many different types of organizations. I mean, in the true sense of the world, word, it, it is consulting, um, but uh, you know, I think it's, it's critical that um, these younger folks going into the economy don't limit their, themselves to idea of what a museum is or you know what museum education is a lot of degrees say you know it's for museum studies but you know my background is actually in public policy and planning so I come come to this field really from more of an analytical standpoint um, and really trying to uplift communities through arts and culture um, so I think that's maybe shifting uh, skill sets of course but also the mentality of who we are as museum professionals critically important yeah, thank you. Um, I might turn now to some questions that are coming in uh, on the chat. The chat. There's a question from uh, Juan Carlos uh, Fernandez Catalan from ICOM Ecuador, and I think this is to all the panelists really. But it's asking if you could give examples of strategies to compensate for activities that um, might have been undertaken by museums that were uh, the source of revenues, the source of income for those museums that have obviously been lost due to COVID, have any of you struck um, the experience of seeing where there are other opportunities that are opening up or other activities or other ways of dealing with those revenue shortfalls? Daniel, I can see you nodding. Is that um, <laughs> something that, that piques your interest? Right, yeah, I mean, so I pursued the grant from uh, the Pulitzer Center on uh, uh, crisis reporting. And what I think we should really uh, look at right now from the perspective of the museum sector is that we're not the only sector hurting, right? So yeah. journalism in particular has experienced um, really a, a downsizing that's been happening over the past decade, two decades. And as we move from the print age to digital age, I think it's, it's really critical that we understand that this uh, crisis has dried up all of the ad revenue for these 
um, news outlets, whether they're online, whether they're in, they're, they're also uh, looking for collaborations. And the more that we can really build those bridges, um, not to present sort of a, a question, you know, in, in the uh, position of journalism, you know, at no point did I tell the journalists what to write about. I just essentially uh, gave them information, helped them find sources, and then they wrote the stories about, uh, about museums across Illinois. So I think it's knowing the knowing how to partner, but knowing, knowing how to sort of uh, map out what the partnership is uh, that makes sure every, everyone's comfortable. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by uh, the fact that in, um, in many cases, we don't have the, um, the, uh, the clear sense of what's happening in some other sectors in, in the broader cultural field. You know, for instance, the performing arts have been so hard hit, the performing arts have been so hard hit in this. One of the strategies that we've used in, uh, in this country, in Australian museums, in fact, my own museum is to commission using colleagues in the performing arts centres, commission some new works created on video that are then used um, within the gallery spaces of the museum, because in relative terms, we're actually doing better than our colleagues in the performing arts. So there's some responsibility. This goes back to, I think, what Katia was saying about partnerships. But Katia, there is a question here for you from uh, Joanna Montero. And it's this, in the face of the pandemic long-term, do you think that the levers for museums identified in the OECD guide for local governments, museums and communities should be reconsidered? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Joanna. So I say hello to Joanna. Um, well, maybe the levers know, because I think the, this, uh, the, the guide uh, remains very, very much relevant because in the guide we were stressing how museums can impact and what museums and local governments can do to increase the impact uh, on education, on well-being, on inclusion, uh, on economic development. So all this remains very much true and also the actions that we suggest remain very much true. But now, uh, of course, the question is the, the capacity, the reduced capacity of museums and local governments to focus on these broader uh, missions. So many museums really need to focus on their primarily mission uh, and unfortunately cut uh, a lot of their outreach projects uh, with hospitals, schools, etc., just to well, survive, uh, basically. Um, but, uh, well, I was just thinking, um, um, it, 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 what could be the potential new sources of income for museums? And, uh, well, once again, uh, we are outside of the museum world, so we don't know uh, uh, very much, but, well, of course, I mean, trying to put myself in the shoes of the local government, uh, they can already help museums to cut some of the costs through some tax reliefs, through uh, rent uh, subsidies, because in many uh, countries, even public museums have to pay for their rent, and this is a substantial part of their uh, expenditure. But, um, well, museums and all governments need, well, museums need to also think about how to become eligible for other uh, sources of public funding, for example, for programs uh, that target social inclusion or education, etc. So become eligible for this uh, um, funding, but also become able to deliver this kind of <laughs> outreach yeah. missions, yeah. maybe. Yeah, indeed. I mean, one of the things I think we're all grappling with is whether there's opportunities for this digital turn to actually be monetized in some way. If, if you're not getting revenue from ticket sales, you know, can you get um, some revenue from, uh, from the digital content that you're making available? But there's, you know, questions of access and equity about these, um, these things as well that I think uh, militate against it. Another question from Yao um, Felix. I might ask Angelita to respond to this in the first instance and then to all panellists if you feel motivated. Business models, business models for museums. Um, should we be so dependent as so many of us are uh, on ticket revenues? And if not, what will we do? What we do to cover for that shortfall? Um, that's a big question. But uh, Angelita, give it a go. Um, I think even pre-pandemic, can I say that um, uh, museums and cultural institutions have been. Um, thinking about this question uh, for a long time. Um, 
from my understanding, revenue um, from tickets only plays a small part in most museums uh, in terms of, of our budgets. Um, I would say in, in um, both my um, experience at the National Museum of Singapore and at the Olympic uh, Museum, uh, revenue generation from tickets only accounts for 10 to, 20, 10 to 15% of the cost of running a museum. So I, I feel that there's a few things that we really have to look at um, in terms of uh, uh, being able to, to sustain ourselves. Uh, one thing is not to be too reliant on, on ticket revenues, uh, but to look at other funding options. Um, of course, you know, um, having longer term um, plans is also essential because we realize we have a lot of, um, with the pandemic, a lot of uh, small institutions are literally hand to mouth, you know, and, and they survive, uh, especially a lot of performing arts uh, um, organizations uh, suffered really, really badly because of that. They had cash flow issues and, and, and so on. Um, Yes, I think one way is really is partnerships, looking at long-term partnership and not just one-off um, you know, opportunities. Uh, being creative in terms of the content we have to be able to create content that's relevant to the communities that we serve. Uh, for, for example, the Olympic Museum, we stop looking at ourselves as purely a sports museum. We look at ourselves as a social history museum. Therefore, there is relevance and therefore there is reason for people to come in and support you because it's really about people at the, at the end of the day, everything that we, that we do. I think that's a, a, a mindset shift that needs to, to uh, go deep uh, into all our planning uh, in, in the long term in terms of content. The other thing is uh, the biggest cost for museums is really about the collection, uh, whether is it in, in terms of storage, conservation, um, and, and acquisitions and, and so forth. I think there has to be, uh, I don't know if I should say this, but especially this is the icon thing. Some rethink a, a, about uh, um, being able to deaccession de collections as well. I think that has always been a taboo, but I think we really need to think about it a little bit deeper because I think if not for the pandemic, if not for, for, for revenue generation, but even for sustainability as well. The final one I will add is the looking into uh, technology to help us to be able to keep the running costs low for some of the things that we, we, we do in museums, you know, like doing documentations, uh, archival works and, and, and so on. So for example, I mean, uh, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, recently uh, we did a project with the Australian uh, uh, Film Archive where we look at synthetic DNA as an option to store all the uh, archival materials that, that we have, you know, which, which is uh, growing and with the use of uh, audio video, uh, audio media, audio video uh, materials, we're looking at huge content. You know, for example, uh, the Tokyo Games, they're looking at doing 8K and not 4K. Can you imagine the amount of data that's generated and we have to store that, all that's cost. So things like, like you know, um, synthetic DNA, which we are uh, piloting and test baiting now, which has been successful. We managed to, if, if done well, we will actually be able to store everything that, that, that which is like 40,000 kilometers of content at, at the Olympic Museum in just this little amount. It's incredible. So I think supporting technology to look at sustainability of the, the um, industry is important as well. So, so, Angela, it sounds like, you know, we should be looking at um, um, costs right across the board, not just salary costs when we're trying yeah. to achieve some sustainability. It's too, it's too easy so often because the salary costs are so high in museums to yeah. think, well, the, the easiest way of dealing with that is to cut salaries. But, in fact, there are other costs that we face that we could, we could look to. Daniel, you, you've got a comment there. Uh, you trying to add to those comments. Um, so, you know, at first, have a cow, you know, I've got a cow back here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, really, you should be stressing about uh, your revenues. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. But what we really should be doing as uh, museum professionals is opening up to different fields to let them know of our situation. Because I think a lot of this conversation is very insular. And, um, you know, we're talking to other museum professionals, but we're really not, um, you know, perhaps showcasing the value that we already bring to our society. For instance, you're here in the United States, uh, museums collectively spend $2 billion on, which 
essentially uh, supplements um, you know, K through 12 uh, schooling across the United States. Why aren't we going to the, you know, uh, the National Education uh, Administration to talk about it? That's really critical in terms of where we can look at not just partnerships from a, program level, a programmatic level, but also from a uh, funding level as well. Mm -hmm. I just wanna... uh, I... Sorry, yes, Maria. Sí, quisiera, quisiera agregar también pues, a, lo, a los comentarios que, que han hecho los, los tres colegas antes y es que esta pandemia también en términos de sostenibilidad, en términos de financiación, eh, saca a relucir la importancia y la necesidad de la política pública. Un poco en, en línea con, con los comentarios de Katia, si no hay política pública eh, para museos, es muy difícil, es muy difícil sobrevivir. If there is not a public policy for museums, it is very difficult to survive. And this is the situation in Colombia. There is not a public policy for museums, unfortunately. Yes, there is a public policy for other sectors, for uh, uh, cinema, movies, uh, performing acts, arts, music, but um, really the culture ministry's uh, agenda has not been interested in developing a public uh, policy for museums. And now there is a pandemic and we have nowhere to go. We have nothing. Resources are being distributed to several different areas. And I believe it's very important, uh, this. And ICOM may have an important role to play here uh, with a very active lobbying uh, activity. Uh, and uh, what I mean here is to put some pressure, uh, positive pressure, to governments for them to develop public policies for the muse museum sector that in times as the ones we are living and in general for in general uh, even if there is no pandemic well we need some some structures to lean on we need some budgeting and uh, the thing is if there is not a public policy there's a budget in the end If I might. Yes. Sorry, Daniel, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know that we're running a little short on time, but I, I know that there are current efforts from ICOM. You know, I, I met with some ICOM colleagues uh, in Washington, D.C. this past February before the, the pandemic set in around uh, Advocacy Day. And so, um, you know, lobbying Congress, I think, is our, our best shot, really, because we are the, the sector that really needs to tell government what we Wants. And, you know, if there's anything I've learned from this, this project, the Prairie State Museums project, is there's a need for us to participate in our democracy and to shape the democracy that we want and respond to the needs of the museum sector. So it's a very good week for us to be discussing about the, the, the fortifying of our democracies, um, Daniel, I think. And, uh, and indeed, uh, in my country, um, we often say in the, uh, in the cultural heritage sector that we wait for the minister that wants to make their name as the great, historically great cultural heritage minister. It's not generally a sector where ministers um, focus their political ambitions, but I, I live in hope that, uh, that one will come. Um, we might end the questions there because we are running out of time. Can I thank uh, our panellists um, tonight for a, a marvellous tour across the issues, if not entirely coming up with all the solutions, at least some, I have to say, in, uh, in the breadth of discussion that we've had and the questions. And in the way of these things, every time you look uh, to the future and consider questions and, and you know, strive to answer some of them, you, a whole series of other questions occurred to you as well. And that's as it should be, because this conversation about how we're coping with this moment is really the conversation we need, not just for COVID-19, but the, the conversation for this century about the recreation of museums uh, that will be fit for purpose uh, in a century that will be dominated by knowledge economies um, will be dominated by the capacity for creative and cultural endeavour, really, and the way that those capacities 
will inform other parts of um, our societies, will sustain them in the way that Daniel was speaking, I think, about the uses of arts and cultural enterprise uh, in, uh, in our countries. And so um, for me, I come away from this thinking about partnerships, I come away thinking about the skills and capabilities that we need, I come away thinking about the relations between the virtual and the real, um, but I'm especially um, preoccupied by this question of um, our younger professionals and how a whole generation really, unless we act in this sector to make sure opportunities exist, a whole generation will be doing other things apart from working in the museum sector. And I, I think that would be a, a great tragedy. Can I thank um, uh, our speakers um, uh, all again uh, tonight, um, Katia, uh, Angelita, Maria Mercedes um, and Daniel uh, for uh, really excellent presentations. And can I just, um, to all of you who've participated in this event tonight, just encourage you to fill in that um, satisfaction survey in the chat box. And if you're in the Yucca platform, again, you need to copy and paste the link for the two questions. I also wanna leave you with the very good news that ICOM has just begun a partnership with the OECD for their webinar series on cultural participation. And the first will take place uh, between December 1 and 3 this year. It's entitled Cultural Participation and Local Resilience, Strategies for Recovery. It sounds like it's going to answer some of the questions that we, um, we ranged across tonight. The deadline for registering for that webinar is November 30. And I really encourage participants to submit case studies for the webinar uh, 10 days earlier by November 20, you don't have much time, a few days left, using the webinar link in the chat box that I'm sure Katya um, has shared or will share um, online. And can I finish um, now by thanking once again the French Ministry of Culture for sponsoring um, this webinar, to our interpreters for their fine work behind the scenes in support of this event, ICOM and their magnificent staff who've put all this together in Paris and elsewhere, our streaming providers um, who've managed to connect us across the world. How good is this? And indeed, all of you for taking part. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you once again. Good night from me and uh, good morning, if that suits you better. All the very best. Bye. Thank you. Bye.